Today we're really happy to be joined by Professor Shannon Bauer, who's calling in from Edinburgh, Gal Gadda, where she's the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh uh, Futures Institute. So normally in this seminar series, we sort of focus on uh, research applications of AI data science, but now we get to sort of just view the topic like as a whole, um, which I think will be make for a really interesting discussion. So whenever you're ready, um, please feel free to get started. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to join. And I'm going to share my screen. Great. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from the past uh, and the future of responsible research and innovation in AI. And um, I'm going to talk about that through the lens uh, of a concept that uh, UK uh, government and uh, particular UK research and innovation have adopted uh, to talk about this in the UK context, and that's to talk about a responsible AI ecosystem. Uh, so uh, I lead a program funded by uh, the UKRI Arts and Humanities Council called BRAID. Uh, that stands for Bridging Responsible AI Divides. And the original call for this program uh, was labeled Enabling a Responsible AI Ecosystem. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means to uh, form and sustain a responsible AI ecosystem, why that's necessary, uh, and uh, how we might go about doing that. So let's start by asking this question, what is responsible AI? Well, there's a number of principles that have been widely agreed upon over the last five to 10 years. So we used to not know exactly what the answer to that question was, what is responsible AI? And arguably there's still much to be said about it. Uh, in fact, part of our BRAID program is to dig deeper into this concept of responsible AI and look at how different communities understand the idea differently and put it into practice differently. But at a very high level, as opposed to how you actually implement it, there is a wide global consensus about what responsible AI is. It's innovation with AI that is trustworthy, fair, just, accountable, transparent, safe, and beneficial to society. So that's the easy part, right? We've come to an agreement that these criteria are essential to responsible AI innovation. If AI cannot be these things, then we're going to find ourselves in trouble. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But the hard part, of course, is figuring out what these things require in practice and how to enable stakeholders within the AI ecosystem to meet these expectations and how to sustain that through the right kinds of incentives and resources. But why do we need to do this at all? Why does AI have to be responsible? Uh, so you might um, also be aware that um, often this language of responsibility is linked with ethics uh, and notions of moral permissibility or rightness or goodness. Um, responsible AI is a way of talking about a more encompassing set of requirements, but that certainly includes AI uh, being ethical, um, being morally permissible to deploy, right? Um, but, but why is this important? So first of all, keep in mind that AI represents a further consolidation of a pattern that we've already seen of social power being concentrated increasingly in the hands of tech companies, developers, and users. So compared with 25 years ago, these stakeholders in society hold far more power, economic power, cultural power, the power to hold and distribute knowledge, uh, and political power. And that consolidation of social power in any remotely democratic society is a cause for concern and requires certain checks and balances or certain kinds of constraints in order to ensure that that power is legitimate and not abused. Uh, or to perhaps even note that there is an upper limit on how much we're willing to allow social power to be concentrated in the hands of a very few. 
And that's where considerations of of equity uh, in society and uh, democratic um, uh, enfranchisement become important. But it's also important to keep in mind that social power without responsibility degrades public trust and confidence. And we see this in pretty much any context where power is deployed in ways that are reckless or harmful or abusive over a long enough period of time, you see whatever institution is deploying that power begins to suffer damage. It begins to crack, it begins to lose social support and cohesion, and those institutions often eventually fail. We see that in politics, we see that uh, in all kinds of contexts, but we also see it in the context of innovation. So innovation without responsibility tends to have uh, the following kinds of effects. It endangers what we call the social license to operate. That's a term that actually uh, arose originally in the context of mining operations uh, in rural areas where the polluting activities and economically predatory activities of the large mining companies would become so offensive to the communities that they were operating in that the communities would start blocking the roads, sabotaging the equipment, um, protesting, uh, and otherwise refusing uh, an organization that had a legal license to operate in those towns or, or communities would start refusing them the social license to operate, right? And so in the environmental context, we talk about the social license to operate, but now we talk about it in the tech context as well. We see, for example, communities where people uh, start refusing to allow things like facial recognition technology to be deployed uh, uh, in the public uh, or to be deployed by uh, policing agencies in their community, and they start passing uh, laws uh, demanding these kinds of constraints. Innovation without responsibility tends to inhibit adoption. Uh, and where adoption does happen, it gets skewed to the most reckless actors who don't have much to lose or her willing to take unreasonable risks. Um, that tends to breed a vicious cycle of social harms. We've certainly seen that in the social media context. And invent incentivizes a short-term sort of race to the bottom to grab as much profit uh, and user share uh, as possible or market share as possible uh, without thinking about the sustainability uh, of that ecosystem. Again, think about the damage to the social media ecosystem that we see currently and the debates that are being had about how to restore a healthy social media ecosystem in a way that uh, is compatible with democratic health. Well, we were only asking that question because we've already seen this process that I'm describing carried out in the social media ecosystem. And we're also seeing uh, that that impedes public support for future innovation. So as I'll say in a minute, we're seeing uh, another wave of what has been called the tech lash, where public attitudes about technology turn negative, right? Uh, and that's a really dangerous thing, right? Because technology is vital to human progress and it's vital to addressing so many of the challenges that we're gonna be facing uh, in the next few decades. And to have public support turn against innovation at that point is incredibly dangerous. So there's some historical context that's useful to have here. Right. So responsible AI is not the first uh, time we've ever had to talk about responsibility in the context of innovation. And in fact, we have centuries of experience with safety critical industries where innovation initially took place uh, without much in the way of ethical constraints or notions of standards of responsibility. And then ultimately, those industries had to mature and uh, develop uh forms of both self-governance and also regulatory governance uh, that allowed them uh, to uh, gain and hold on to public trust and confidence. Uh, the very first example of this uh, in uh, the West is actually the steamboat industry. So that's the image on the upper left, right? So in the 19th century, steamboats were actually incredibly dangerous things. Uh, steamboat boilers blew up a lot and caused horrible injuries. Uh, and people started getting very upset about the fact that bodies kept landing on the shore from steamboats blowing up. And no one could quite understand why the boilers blew up or how exactly to minimize uh, the risk of that. 
And over decades, that led to the creation of the first tech regulatory uh, agency, actually the first federal regulatory agency in the United States at all, was created to govern steamboats. And in fact, became the foundation of the entire regulatory landscape uh, in the United States uh, and uh, built the transportation regulations uh, that we uh, still uh, live by, uh, both in uh, America and other places that then began to model those regulatory structures. And we've, of course, seen that uh, in uh, civil and mechanical engineering. Uh, you cannot build a bridge uh, without meeting uh, certain standards. Uh, and requirements of responsible practice. Um, we see it in the pharmaceutical industry and biomedical industry more broadly. We have a separate set of standards for responsible uh, development of uh, biomedical devices uh, and regulation of biomedical devices. Uh, we see it in aviation, uh, which is something I'll talk about more in a moment. We see it certainly in the automobile industry, right? So we've been through this process actually many times of an initially immature industry that was producing uh, excessive uh, public dangers through reckless practice had to be uh, shaped into a responsible industry uh, that people could trust. So we've got some contemporary warning lights on the dashboard today. Um, so here's a couple of kind of headline clippings from recent uh, events involving Boeing, which I'm sure everyone here is probably pretty well aware of. Uh, and the uh, autonomous uh, vehicle uh, company Cruise that is a spin out of GM, General Motors. So uh, you might might have heard of Cruise uh, being uh, refused its license uh, by the California uh, Department of Motor Vehicles to operate its vehicles in San Francisco because of an incident in which not only did uh, a vehicle run over and drag a pedestrian, uh, but what was more concerning to the DMV is that uh, Cruz covered up the evidence of it from uh, those who were charged with oversight uh, of this pilot. And it was the irresponsible and unethical concealing of the nature of the incident uh, that led uh, the regulator uh, to um, refuse further permission to operate to Cruz. And that caused tremendous commercial damage also uh, to Cruz's uh, uh, plans uh, for further rollouts uh, of, of its technology. We've seen a similar pattern uh, recently with Boeing, which has a much older reputation. Uh, there used to be a saying in the 70s and 80s, uh, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. And that was a safety motto. What that meant is Boeing is the airplane that I trust not to fall out of the sky because the culture of safety engineering at Boeing was seen as the strongest, uh, arguably, in the world. Its fortunes have turned quite sharply in the last decade. Uh, so uh, we're not just, of course, talking about the most recent example of the door plug flying off that Boeing now says it doesn't have any records of it being repaired in the first place, which is uh, almost uh, catastrophically unheard of uh, in a safety critical industry like this. Uh, we're also talking about going all the way back to 2019, uh, the um, capture of its own regulator and irresponsible conduct, which led to the crashes of the 737 MAX aircraft and the eventual firing of its CEO. So now we've got a very steep uh, climb, right, uh, for, for Boeing to, to rebuild trust. And it's no longer about the 737 MAX only. It's apparently a kind of comprehensive failure uh, of its safety culture. Uh, but it's not just about aviation, right? Um, trust in the tech industry, broadly speaking, uh, has uh, been struggling uh, to uh, stay above water for a while. Um, and so we see over the past few years a, a constant uh, flow of evidence uh, that public trust in, in tech is very fragile. And now with AI, we see a laundry list of problems that do not have easy solutions uh, and that are damaging public trust in AI, whether we're talking about the racial bias uh, that's endemic in these systems, uh, their uh, tendency to produce uh, toxic and harmful outputs or misinformation, uh, their uh, growing climate uh, cost uh, and their effects on things like democracy, uh, right? So that last image there uh, showed that um, 
uh, the AI models that were tested by Alondra Nelson, who uh, has led the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, and Julia Angwin, who's been a longtime investigative reporter in this area, they showed that 50 percent of AI models' responses to questions that voters might ask were inaccurate, right? So that's potentially danger, endangering the ability uh, of uh, people to uh, have the information they need in order uh, to vote as responsible citizens. So these are just part of a kind of laundry list of issues with uh, AI that have already been identified, right? So the worry that AI automation might degrade human abilities, reduce our autonomy and opportunities. Uh, I've already talked about the centralization and consolidation of power, amplification of bias and inequality, uh, the fact that uh, these systems are unpredictable and opaque, uh, which causes particular worries when combined with the potential for loss of human control over the operation of these systems. Um, I've already mentioned their environmental costs, uh, the fact that the social power uh, that they represent is not just opaque, but also unelected and unaccountable in the way that governments uh, can be held to account. Uh, and I've mentioned the growing public resentment and distrust that follows, right? So, uh, in fact, uh, Axios recently, uh, just last week, released a study uh, showing that public trust in AI is sinking across the board. For those of us that care about AI, think it has tremendous potential to benefit uh, human beings, then this is this is a worry, right? Uh, this is something we cannot allow to continue. Um, the commercial and public adoption of AI and integration of it successfully into society is not a foregone conclusion. Look at GMOs, look at nuclear power. Uh, these are two examples of technologies that uh, actually hold a tremendous amount of potential human benefit. And yet GMOs in Europe uh, became such an object of public distrust, uh, despite a scientific consensus that in fact used responsibly GMOs were a vital tool for uh, agricultural resilience and and public health. Uh, still, uh, you ended up uh, seeing GMOs uh, widely, uh, actually GMO foods actually widely outlawed uh, as a result of this public distrust. Uh, you see similar examples of people turning against nuclear power, uh, despite the fact that you know from from the perspective of costs and benefits, uh, it still might in our current climate situation be a net positive. Okay, so we don't want this to happen with AI, right? So we've got two models of innovation that we can talk about. One is the one I've already mentioned, the social media platform model of innovation, uh, which we know is well summarized by Mark Zuckerberg's phrase, move fast and break things. Or we can follow the older tested, tried and true model of innovating boldly, but responsibly. And that's how we built a successful aviation industry in the 20th century. That's how bioengineering became integrated uh, into the medical system in a way that is widely trusted and safe. And we have to ask ourselves, which path do we want AI to take? I think it's pretty clear what the answer needs to be, but the incentives currently favor the first path and not the second. And that's the problem that we have to address. Because the cost to society of pursuing that model of innovation for social media was very high. We ended up with lasting damage to democratic norms, to social trust in institutions, to social and civic cohesion, and to political rationality. That's pretty bad. Do we really want to do that again with AI? And in fact, the consequences of following model one with AI would be arguably much worse. So it's important to think of the metaphors that we use for AI, right? So AI isn't the new oil, it's the new steel. What that means is it's infrastructure, right? It, it's, it, it becomes the bones of the built world uh, if it rolls out in the way that many people expect, where AI will be integrated into the backbone of every industry, um, every system in the built world uh, that we use. And Steel production actually has to be a very tightly regulated industry. You actually have to test steel very, very carefully to make sure that it's properly produced, that it's safe, that it's resilient, and that it's fit for the purposes that it's used. We don't have anything like that for AI. So the social cost of Model 1 for AI innovation could be catastrophic, which means 
that if we're even remotely rational, responsible, AI is the only other path. Okay, so uh, that invites, as I've said, some parallels uh, with the ethical maturing and professionalization of other tech fields over time. So we've done this before. Uh, the medical profession went through a similar uh, period over a century of internalizing ethics, actually, uh, as part of uh, the practice. So uh, medical uh, uh, doctors largely uh, see their code of ethics as self-imposed uh, and uh, shared within the community, as opposed to being something that society expects of them and they do only reluctantly, right? So we need a similar sort of transformation uh, with uh, the culture of computer science and uh, software engineering, right? Where the ethical expectations of that profession are internalized and uh, championed from within. So this requires learning lessons from the past, but also requires innovating with new modes of governance, right? That doesn't just happen automatically. You have to do things in order to make that happen. Uh, we've already got deep foundations of knowledge and practice in the field of responsible AI and AI ethics that's been going for over a decade, right? So we've built that body of knowledge on top of existing knowledge from the 80s, 90s, and O's in fields like software engineering ethics, data ethics, robot ethics or robo-ethics, human-machine interaction, human-computer interaction, and responsible research and innovation, all of which predated the latest AI wave. Right. So we've built the field of AI ethics and responsible AI largely on top of deeper foundations. And thankfully, we've got rapidly growing government support and investment uh, in the UK, in the USA, in, e in the EU uh, and in a growing number of other countries. So in the UK alone, um, we've seen over 100 million pounds invested specifically in responsible AI research over the past year. Uh, and there's more coming. Okay, so um, my final section will be talking just a little bit about this responsible AI ecosystem uh, metaphor. So why have we framed this as an ecosystem? Well, the first thing is AI is not one thing, but many. So I said AI was like steel, but that's not quite right either. It's like steel in the sense that it's infrastructure, but it's not like steel in the sense that steel is kind of one thing, uh, but AI is not just generative AI. AI is not just chat GPT. AI is a wide range of different techniques and applications that are still being developed uh, in new ways. So we can't see AI as a single thing to govern. We have to see it as part of a system. And AI systems emerge from a complex shifting and global web of distributed yet interdependent actors, right? So not only is AI one not one thing, it's not built by any one group or entity. So the responsible AI ecosystem has a, a number of complex ecologies within it, just like a real ecosystem on the planet has composite ecologies. So the responsible AI ecosystem has a material ecology, a corporate ecology, a public ecology, a tech ecology. We might be able to break this out and classify it in lots of different ways, but this is just one way of thinking about it. So if we think about the material ecology of AI, right, we're talking about the data suppliers, the energy suppliers, the human labor suppliers, and the material resources, the water, the, the, the silicon, the conflict minerals uh, required for, for GPUs. Um, there's a lot more to it, right? But there's a lot of matter. There's a lot of stuff that goes into AI. And uh, Kate Crawford and Vlad and Joller did this incredible um, artwork, uh, a schematic uh, of uh, the AI ecosystem that uh, was displayed, uh, still is displayed, I think, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, but is visible on the web. And this is just a piece of it. You, it, it, it takes forever to kind of see it all uh, because you can zoom in and out at different levels uh, and it's simply massive. But it's a way of representing all of the things in the AI ecosystem that we actually often don't see. There's a tech ecology of AI, right? The uh, expertise uh, that's required to sustain it from data scientists, AI researchers, model developers, engineers, tech leads uh, and uh, uh, product managers, the model and product testers, the API and UI developers, 
the ML fairness, trust and safety and responsible AI teams, the professional to tech, tech societies and standards organizations, the AI research publication venues and conferences, right? The list goes on. There's a whole kind of ecosystem of technological expertise and knowledge that sustains uh, the larger e uh, ecosystem. And that is intersecting and overlapping in various ways with the corporate ecology, right? Some of that tech ecology happens in academia. Some of it happens in the public sector. A lot of it happens uh, in corporations. And the corporate ecology of AI includes the large platform companies and, and uh, cloud providers, uh, the investors, the AI startups and open source uh, organizations, the AI research organizations, the logistics and supply chain companies, third-party apps and services, consulting firms, AI auditing firms, corporate boards and lobbyists, business users, and on and on, right? And then finally, there's a public ecology of AI that we need to think about. Everything from the individual consumers or end users of AI products to impacted communities who often are not users of the tech but are impacted by it and sometimes harmed by it anyway. Public institutions, universities, NHS, courts, media, civil society policy and advocacy organizations, academic societies, public research funding agencies, local, regional, national governments, national policymakers, legislators, regulators, and intergovernmental bodies like the UN, World Economic Forum, and OECD, just to give a few examples, right? So those of us here in, in academia are part of the public ecology of AI, but we may also be related to other uh, ecologies uh, that I've mentioned as, as well, right? We might be part of the tech ecology or uh, part of the corporate ecology. So ecosystems require that the there be a kind of healthy and sustainable equilibrium in the relationships between the component uh, ecologies and the ecologies themselves have to have that kind of equilibrium and balance, right? So a thriving ecosystem is balanced by the health of its component ecologies. You can't sacrifice one for another in an ecosystem, right? You can't just yank out one of the eco uh, one of the ecologies within it without the ecosystem itself usually collapsing or becoming destabilized. So what we're talking about then is a lot of symbiotic relationships within an ecosystem that add that stability and resilience, right? So you have to think about how the relationships between the actors within that ecosystem relate in ways that are sustainable and contribute to the flourishing of both. So healthy ecosystems are regulated by constant adjustment to a dynamic environment. Brittle ecosystems tend to collapse, right? So the idea is you need an ecosystem to be resilient to shocks, and that means you need a lot of adaptability, mobility, and flexibility within the way the ecosystem works. So if we think about regulation as part of an AI ecosystem, we know that AI is going to develop in ways that are unpredictable, protean, hard to uh, anticipate, and that means that we need more agile and responsive forms of governance, including regulation, than the kinds of regulation where you make the law and then it lasts for a hundred years unchanged, right? We know that's not going to work with AI. So we have to think about how to build a regulatory um, ecology within the AI ecosystem that will be adaptive. Uh, and we need other mechanisms of resistance and resilience as well. Um, we need responsibility for the health of the ecosystem to rest with the agents with the power to damage those component ecologies and the ecosystem and the knowledge that they can do otherwise, right? So one of the really important things about responsible AI is thinking about where the responsibility lies and ensuring that you do not place responsibility on disempowered publics and groups. So you can't tell people to protect themselves when they don't have the tools or the resources to do so. Uh, and you can't tell parts of an ecosystem uh, that have no power to uh, repair that ecosystem. So we have to be able to place the responsibility where it belongs, which is currently largely with the tech companies that have that outsized power within the ecosystem. So I'll wrap up with some final lessons uh, from the ecological metaphor. Uh, so uh, it's really important to consider that responsible AI policy and practice Oh, you've um, gone quiet, Shannon. Uh, I think you hit the mute button. Let me just ask you to unmute again. <clears throat> Sorry, it was it was saying that I couldn't unmute, um, but I can now. Thanks. 
All right. So uh, responsible AI policy and practice has to manage the health of all the AI ecosystems ecologies. It has to build symbiotic relationships within and across those ecologies. It has to be guided by coordinated, agile, and responsive regulation to shocks to that ecosystem. And it has to properly distribute duties of care to the most powerful actors across those component ecologies. And that leaves us with a number of challenges and opportunities, right? So first of all, we need better maps of the AI ecosystems, regional and global ecologies, key interdependencies and dynamics. So that map that Kate Crawford produced is, uh, and Vlad and Joller produced is a, is a great start, but it's already outdated, right? So we need ways to regularly uh, depict those ecosystems, um, uh, those ecologies and their dynamics. We need to boost the ecological knowledge of powerful actors of the vulnerabilities in that AI ecosystem. Uh, think about the parallel to the climate context, right? Where we have to boost the knowledge of the most powerful actors in the ecosystem of the ways that their actions are damaging the health and sustainability of the overall ecosystem. But it's not enough for people to know what those vulnerabilities are. They also have to have the interests uh, aligned with sustaining that ecosystem. They have to have the incentives to take responsibility for the vulnerabilities that they themselves uh, generate or perpetuate. And right now, we don't have that kind of alignment in the climate context, and we don't have that kind of alignment in the AI ecosystem either, right? The most powerful actors right now are not well incentivized to take care of the ecosystem uh, or uh, ensure that it is healthy and sustainable. They're incentivized to gain the most profit from their place in the ecosystem right now. What that ecosystem looks like five years from now is not part of their concern. Their incentives are not aligned with that longer time horizon, much less a 10 to 20 to 50 year time horizon. And in fact, that's why you see a lot of powerful uh, AI research scientists expressing alarm about that and asking for uh, attention to longer term concerns. Many of us are skeptical about some of that language when it gets to talking about existential risks and begins to uh, diverge into science fiction rather than real concerns about responsible AI governance. Uh, but, but it is a legitimate worry that uh, people right now often aren't incentivized to think about the long term health of AI and society. Uh, and that's what uh, a responsible AI ecosystem uh, needs to be able to do is monitor uh, its own health uh, and, and understand the long-term indicators of health, not just the short-term. We need to also bridge the artificial divides between sectors and disciplines in the AI ecosystem that are currently blocking ecological understanding, communication, and coordination. So in a natural ecosystem, there's a lot of signaling that goes on between the different organisms uh, and the different communities within uh, that ecosystem. There's a lot of signaling that goes on uh, that allows for that kind of health of the ecosystem and equilibrium to form. Um, similarly, in a healthy tech ecosystem, there's a lot of healthy information flow and signaling going on between different stakeholders and communities, right? Right now, we don't have that in the AI ecosystem. It's very difficult for AI researchers to uh, communicate often uh, with other kinds of audiences. Uh, government actors often uh, lack the uh, either the ability or the access to uh, uh, understanding the way these technologies work. Uh, you've got a lot of misinformation then that kind of sneaks into those channels. So we have to bridge some of these divides between the different stakeholders in the AI ecosystem. And that's largely what BRAID is about. So the BRAID project we lead uh, is about a lot of different things. It's a, it's a large multi-year 16 million pound program that's gonna last till 2028. So we're doing a lot of different stuff. But the acronym, right, Bridging Responsible AI Divides is about doing precisely this. Uh, and, and we can talk more if you have questions about, about how we are, are pursuing that. We also need data and AI, prof AI professionals to build the foundational skills and professional cultures of safety, trustworthiness, and responsibility that enabled those other safety critical industries that I mentioned to endure, to grow, and to flourish, uh, and to gain greater public trust over time instead of losing it. Um, 
And I think that is a, a big part of what those of us who work in the responsible AI field uh, spend our time on. We spend our time uh, developing knowledge that builds those foundational skills, uh, but it's very hard to change the professional culture of AI. And that's a challenge that I think has to come very much from within in the way that I mentioned in the medical profession, uh, the culture of safety and responsibility uh, and care uh, for things like uh, patient autonomy and consent and transparency. Uh, that all came uh, through a long and sometimes painful process of maturity within the uh, professional culture. Uh, and that's something that is just now starting in uh, the AI context. So that's it uh, for my presentation. And uh, if you're interested in kind of staying connected with Braid and what we're doing, uh, please feel free to uh, visit us at our website and sign up to our newsletter. And um, happy to take questions from here. Thanks. Thanks very much. So we'll take questions from the room first. Anybody online who wants to ask a question, please just raise your hand or drop it in the chat. So start up any questions in the room? David? Um, you, you were talking a lot about sort of slightly longer term timescales, sort of, and you mentioned up to 50 years. Do you, a lot of what AI can do now is very new. And if I'm being brutally honest, quite a lot of it is very heavily oversold. People claim that it's going to do amazing things. And then like the self-driving cars, it turns out it really can't. And it probably never will, or at least not in a reasonable time scale. So is yep. a lot of this going to be about managing that people do not sell AI as being much more than it really is? Or is this mostly going to be about actually trying to make sure that the, the worst excesses of AI are at least called out, if not reined in? I would say both of those things hang together um, because I think a lot of the harms that you see happening with AI often didn't happen because people were evil or malicious or deliberately reckless. Um, they were overconfident in the ability of the technology uh, to uh, be reliable and safe in its use. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes people know the tools are dangerous and just use them uh, because they're bad actors or use them because uh, they uh, are, are cheap and available. But uh, you have seen a lot. I, I've seen this in the public sector, and uh, particularly not, not with anything you would call AI, but precursors to AI, you know, algorithms that are used to automate things like um, uh, decisions about uh, public benefits, right? Um, or to identify uh, and, and predict fraud among applicants for public benefits. Almost everywhere that was tried over the past 10 years has resulted in an absolute disaster uh, with often tens of thousands of ruined lives. Um, in uh, the U.S., I can think of four states that are still tied up in lawsuits uh, over these failures. Um, the Dutch government had to resign in 2021 uh, because their deployment of these kinds of algorithms was so disastrous. Uh, I think in the Netherlands, there are still 2,000 kids who um, haven't been reunited with their families who were taken away as a result of a faulty algorithm. Um, so these kinds of deployments weren't intended to hurt people but they were caused because people were overconfident in what algorithms do, right? And they believed that algorithms were always gonna be more objective and reliable uh, than people making judgments about these matters. And in fact, that's just not the case. A poorly designed, a poorly designed, uh, poorly implemented algorithm can do far worse uh, than even the most underpaid and overstressed human. So I do think that there's a link between understanding the limits they're very real, as you say, limits of even the best AI technologies today and the prevention of grave harms that will further damage the reputation of this technology. So if you truly understand the capabilities of these systems, uh, you're much more likely to design an application that's fit for purpose uh, and that's going to actually uh, allow you to scaffold further uh, uh, improvements of the service or product or whatever that you've uh, intermediated with this technology. If you if you think that it's somehow, 
you know, the way that people thought that social media was going to be magic democracy sauce and you just sprinkle it on on everything, right? And suddenly this was how everyone talked in their early O's, right? Um, that the internet was going to magically make uh, democracy happen. And you hear people talking about AI that way today with things like climate change. Like they'll say, well, we're, we, you know, we, we don't really have to worry about the climate impact of AI because AI is going to solve climate change. AI is going to solve our energy problems. Um, that is an extremely dangerous uh, kind of rhetoric. Um, at the same time, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and ignore the opportunities to use AI to actually boost our knowledge and capacity to produce renewable energy and uh, more uh, climate efficient systems. So I really worry about this backlash against AI, which comes from overestimating its t its capacities, because then we end up turning away from the opportunities to actually invest in it uh, in a reasonable and um, beneficial way. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. Hey, Lauren. Um, I'm kind of picking up on something you already said, but I think you mentioned that kind of a key component of responsible AI is creating the incentive. I imagine especially for kind of corporate players when profit is, of course, kind of the driving interest for them yeah. at the moment. Um, is that incentive mostly just via regulation or how do you think you would achieve that? Yeah, there's a couple of levers. I mean, you would love people to just do the right thing um, because it's the right thing, but um, you can't expect people to act contrary to their incentives. That's just not how people work, right? Um, and so if you, particularly if you, when you, when you get on large scales, so if you're looking at a corporation, corporation doesn't have a conscience. Um, it's not supposed to, it's, it's, it's supposed to uh, not be a person, um, but an organization that's governed um, by, by certain incentives. And it, frankly, we know that this is just a, the much bigger problem in society that goes well beyond AI is that we have allowed um, the uh, economic order uh, to become uh, decoupled from principles of responsible governance more broadly. So, you know, there's a point in my talks where someone will raise their hands and say, but don't we have to fix capitalism for any of this to work, right? Um, but the fact is, is, as I said, what's really important is to learn from history. So this is certainly not the first time in history where we've had an industry that's incentivized to be predatory, reckless, uh, profit seeking to the uh, um, uh, disadvantage of uh, wider publics and society. That has happened again and again and again. And we've, in these other industries, uh, then developed uh, better systems of incentives. Now those include liability. Now that you can do this in a carrot and stick way. So you can have large penalties and they have to be large for companies that fail to innovate responsibly. It can't be the kinds of penalties that the EU was developing for social media platforms where the penalties were dwarfed by the profits that could be uh, obtained by uh, continuing with business as usual. So a lot of the platform companies said, yeah, we'll just pay that fine. It's yeah, we'll pay the fines and keep going the way we're going. So you can have penalties that are large enough but you can also give competitive advantages to companies who are willing to invest in responsible uh, innovation. You can lower the liability for organizations that have demonstrated uh, that kind of responsibility. In fact, uh, we've used that technique in aviation where we basically say, look, if you can demonstrate that you complied with all of the uh, relevant safety regulations, that your processes were more or less intact, uh, that none of the uh, safety uh, systems that you're required to keep in place were subverted um, if you were transparent, uh, and yet there was an accident and a bunch of people died, your liability uh, is, uh, is is capped at, a, at an amount that you can afford to pay. It's only when we can show that you were negligent or dishonest or, or violated the regulatory constraints in some way that's fairly grievous, in that case, the cap might go away and you might face fines that are uh, or uh, possible uh, lawsuits that are uh, fatal to your company. Right. So if you if you die in an airplane crash, um, most likely the amount of money you can get from that airline is capped at a pretty low level. Right. You can't sue them for a billion dollars or it just doesn't doesn't happen because the law caps that liability 
so that the companies can afford to take the risks that they need to take. But if they take risks that are greater than they're allowed to take, then it's a potentially a different story. Um, and we, we've used that, in other, that approach in other industries as well. So you can actually reduce the costs for responsible innovators. Um, and uh, that's uh, a particularly attractive strategy. You can also do things like licensing. Uh, that's kind of more on the medical model, right? Where you look at individual actors and you require them to have a certain amount of training on the ethical standards of their profession. And then you have the ability to, to essentially uh, strip someone of their earning capacity in the profession if they are shown to have been uh, uh, grievously irresponsible. And uh, I mean, you, you normally have to violate the ethical standards pretty, pretty severely to, to face this penalty. But we see this in the legal profession. We see this in the um, uh, uh, medical profession. And there are some engineering uh, societies in which you can kind of be stripped of your license to practice if you're shown uh, not to meet the demand, ethical demands of the profession uh, to a certain degree. Um, so we can think about licensing models for, for certain categories of AI professionals that can be combined with these kind of corporate incentives. We can think about public funding for AI applications that are socially beneficial. Uh, we can think about um, companies being taxed more heavily if they are um, uh, not cooperating with or contributing to a responsible AI ecosystem. You can think of procurement measures, which uh, mean that governments won't buy AI products from you unless you can be shown to meet these exceedingly high standards for responsible practice. These are all techniques that we have developed with testing and auditing regimes. Again, those go back to the steamboats where we started doing inspect requiring federal inspection of steamboat boilers, federal licensing of operators, and a series of incentive changes. It took 30 years to get it right. That's the only thing. It took 30 years to get the steamboat regulation system, but that was built from nothing. We didn't have any of those techniques. They had to be invented. And so now we can build on the knowledge we have, but we can also invent new governance measures. Um, so my uh, PhD student, Bhargavi Ganesh, works on this, precisely this question. Can we think of AI governance itself as an opportunity to innovate? Uh, we, can, we can use the tools that we already know uh, have worked in the past, but since AI is different in a lot of ways, we might have to invent some new tools to govern it. And we ought to be, we ought to be enthusiastically pursuing that possibility. So I think this actually links quite nicely with the question we've just got in the chat, uh, which is, how would you compare the risks associated with AI today to the risks associated with digitalization 20 years ago? They feel similar in terms of cybersecurity, digital ethics, privacy, fake news, misinformation. And the tech sector has successfully, maybe you'll disagree, uh, managed those risks in the past, um, including reputational risks. And in that case, regulation was far behind as well. Um, why is it different this time? Yeah, I'm going to disagree with the with the premise that um, the tech companies have managed those risks. Uh, as I said, we, we actually, in a in a lot of ways, are in a much more fragile position than uh, we were 20 years ago uh, in terms of political global political stability. Uh, uh, trust in institutions continues to decline. Um, uh, information quality is actually often uh, judged to be lower than it was in, let's say, the first decade uh, of uh, of this century. Uh, you know, people talk about, for example, it's anecdotal, right? But people talk about the, the decline in the quality of Google search. Um, Cory Doctorow is someone who's talked a lot about, he uses the word enshittification to talk about the way that the quality of a lot of tech platforms and services uh, and the benefits that they provide has actually uh, been declining for for some time as a result of uh, the the business models being misaligned uh, with with better products and services. Um, and we can look at things like um, uh, the um, cybersecurity practice. Even um, you know, health uh, clinics across the United States are currently. Uh, a, a whole group of them across every state, uh, the United Healthcare System, um, which is a has nothing to do with the government. It's a 
private healthcare system in the U.S. Uh, United Healthcare is pretty much frozen now by ransomware. So I would not say we have managed the cybersecurity risks. Uh, ransomware uh, has become a huge crisis. Uh, and things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency have made it easier uh, for uh, bad actors to exploit cybersecurity loopholes and attack organizations and hold them hostage. So, yeah, I just got to disagree with the whole premise that trusting the model that got us here uh, is going to pan out well. Um, and I see AI as an amplifier of all of those risks, potentially, um, just as it can amplify many of the benefits of digitalization. Um, it absolutely is an amplifier of, of the risks as well. It's like gasoline. You, you pour it on a fire, it makes the fire bigger, um, whether the fire is useful and warming your feet or whether it's burning down your house, right? So uh, you have to begin to tackle some of these bigger problems with the incentives in the tech ecosystem because the stakes are getting bigger. Great, thank you. Um, so another question online. How do you get government buy-in uh, to this before significant harms have already occurred? It often seems regulation only comes around after you know, harms, of, harms of, uh, are caused or there's some kind of big story in the press. So I, I guess kind of building on from that, are there any examples of other industries in the past that have successfully self-regulated or had regulation imposed upon them before something catastrophic happened? Uh, yeah, I think the one example of that is um, genetic engineering and um, uh, particularly uh, uh, stem cell and germline engineering. Uh, so in the 1970s, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the first Asilomar conference. So some of you might be familiar with the Asimilar, Asimilar uh, conference on AI that happened maybe about five years back that Elon Musk put together. But that was not the first Asilomar conference. And it was modeled on the Asilomar conference on um, uh, germline engineering. Uh, Asilomar is a conference center uh, in on the coast of California. And uh, in uh, the 70s, uh, researchers in the field of um, uh, biology and, uh, uh, and, and bioengineering met to discuss the risks that they foresaw coming from uh, the ability to edit the human genome. Uh, and they uh, agreed upon a voluntary moratoria on uh, germline uh, engineering uh, applications uh, with with only a few kind of carve outs for for fundamental research. Um, and that was something that then spurred uh, lawmakers in some places to kind of mirror that with regulation. But it was actually the scientists who, before the harms actually started showing up, said, you know what, this could be devastating if it's conduct if this kind of research is conducted without proper oversight. So let's put a moratoria in place until we can get those governance structures built. Um, that's the only example I can actually uh, think of where the uh, intervention was precautionary. Um, but I don't think we have to worry about that because the harms are already here from AI. I mean, I this that's not what this presentation was about, but I could give you a whole a whole presentation that would take an hour just to outline top level a, a lot. In fact, arguably, a lot of the harms are are materializing before the promised benefits. And that's a problem, right? But but it's not it's not surprising. It's it's easy to break something. It takes work to make it better. So AI can make things better, but it's going to take time to use AI in ways that are reliably socially beneficial. That requires a lot of tinkering, requires a lot of testing. Um, to use something recklessly in a way that just causes uh, kind of you know damage in a stochastic way, like that's that's easy, that's quick. And so that's what we're seeing in the AI ecosystem, unsurprisingly, is if you don't have it governed, the harms are going to come first, not the benefits. Um, but that can delay the benefits arriving, again, if that turns people against adoption, if that uh, discourages public investment, um, if that uh, makes people uh, risk intolerant. Uh, and so I, I, I think we have to manage this in a way that thinks about how to allow responsible innovation to continue because the idea, for example, that regulation and governance stifle innovation, that has just been empirically disproven so many times that it makes people like me tear our hair out when we hear it. It's just a complete lie. 
I mean, sure, there are examples of bad regulation that have stifled innovation, but there are many more examples of regulation that actually allowed innovation to happen and be sustained. Again, in the aviation industry, in the 1960s, planes fell out of the sky every week, literally every week, a plane full of people would fall out of the sky. Flying was quite dangerous. By the turn of this century, uh, an airline crash was a once in a year thing that would become international news because it was so rare. Um, and that was despite many more planes being in the air than in the 1960s, right? So many more opportunities for failure and a drastically reduced rate of failure. How did that happen? That happened over decades of regulatory and governance improvements to aviation safety. It did not happen on its own. The commercial incentives did not drive it. It required regulation. And you saw with the Boeing 737 MAX that the minute you loosen the governance knob, the minute you turn the company over to itself, the incentives that they have to simply seek profit begin to take over. And then the airplanes start falling out of the sky again. So uh, again, we just need to learn from what we already know and then build and innovate upon that with AI governance. And uh, I think the, we're seeing now governments acknowledge the need for that, which is great, um, but they're still largely subject to lobbying, subject to, um, to fear to be uh, seen as uh, a, a hostile place for these companies to innovate. So it, it's partly about ensuring that the companies can be enlisted to support responsible regulation that allows them to innovate, allows the, the AI ecosystem to thrive. So I think that's getting close. I'll t um, I do have another uh, engagement that I have to run to, but um, I can take one more question. Oh, I've actually <laughs> Um, it's somewhat related to that. Um, I know you kind of um, comparing it to um, what they do in uh, medical practice. Um, will, uh, with AI, will it require um, more of the way that they do it in um, aviation, where if an accident happens, you know, everything's transparent and they look at it, like you said, you know, it's catastrophic, a plane's fallen out of the sky. Whereas in like medicine, that's happening every day. Would it does it have to take them? Would it have to be transparent? That's a really great question. Um, and I don't have time to give a, a, a full answer, but there's a lot of work that's been done on algorithmic auditing and AI uh, audits and uh, evaluations. Uh, and so there's, uh, a, a, I think that I the answer to your question is the model of transparency for AI won't exactly match the medical one or the aviation one. Um, I tend to think it's going to be more like the aviation one in that you know you'll you'll need to have um no you know what I'm not going to say that I I'm I'm really unsure what the what the what the model for auditing and inspection uh will turn out to be and I think it will be sector specific so I think if you're using AI in a safety critical environment what you're going to need is going to look a lot more like the aviation uh case if you're using it in a way where you know, it affects individual people's rights, um, then uh, you, you might have something much more like the kind of clinical case where a lot of it is about the relationships between clinicians and their and their patients, right? And a lot of it is governed uh, by those kind of relational norms. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done to figure out what the right model for AI is. Uh, one of the things that's common to both of those cases is something like incident reporting, though. Uh, hospitals have to report um, when you have an unexpected death or as a result of a procedure. Like if you go into a surgery, um, surgery in the US sense, not the UK sense, but if you go into a surgical theater and have an operation that's supposed to be a relatively safe operation and you die on the operating table, someone has to report that uh, and someone has to inspect that and those records have to be made available to medical regulators so that if there's a pattern that starts to emerge, they can find out. Uh, similarly, with aviation, uh, if there's a near miss in the sky, if two planes get too close to one another, someone has to make a report of that. And that report goes to the regulator. And the regulator has the ability to notice 
and take action if there's a pattern that seems to emerge where near misses are happening too often, more than would statistically be expected, or a particular operator seems to be having more near misses, right? So I think that model, which you see in both uh, uh, cases, is something we definitely need for AI where there's a formal incident reporting and transparency requirement for AI harms. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much for all the time you've given us today. I'm sure uh, everyone here really appreciates it. So we'll give our speaker one last round of applause. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thanks.